high level overview of what is blockchain versus what is Bitcoin, what is cryptocurrency, uh, what are we talking about? What is Bitcoin? Versus blockchain. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. Well, stop. I'm going to try and be nice here and not come across as a complete psychopath. Um, so, Bitcoin was uh, an innovation that was given to us, uh, the end was announced on the end of 2008, and it became a thing in 2009 uh, when somebody or a group uh, called Satoshi Nakamoto released a white paper and then mined the, the Genesis block. And the, the whole idea behind Bitcoin is to separate money and state. So um, basically, it's our only opportunity for human beings to have sound money. So this is money that can't be manipulated by a central controller. Um, and it has been running now for 13 years. Uh, it's had a few hiccups along the way. Um, it's been attacked a lot, um, and it continues to be attacked. But it seems to just continue going on and on and on. So that's Bitcoin. Um, and then the blockchain is basically a really slow, crappy database um, that a lot of salesmen have tried to pitch as the the solution to problems that don't exist, um, and it's now been pivoted many times by the marketers, um, and it's continually solved. And then altcoins are basically created by people that have seen Bitcoin and the monetization of Bitcoin, and they just basically created their own because it's all open source. You can make a copy uh, of the code base and launch your own coin with a whole bunch of marketing and just sell it to, to people to, to put the price and you can dump on them. So that's the difference between the, the three. We are an opinionated group of people. <laughs> We're technically competent, and we can actually go through the technicals of that. Yeah. Denise, do you want to expand on any of that? <laughs> <laughs> Not too much to expand on really, I think, but um, I think Danny, as much as I'd say, um, a blunt view of, of the three uh, there, it's pretty accurate view, in my opinion. Um, I think there's it's a kind of bull reality. Cool. Um, and Mike, your company works with stable coins, so where does that fit into the whole I think I'm, I think I'm the salesman that you know, <laughs> says problems that don't exist. I'm not, they do exist. So the way I see blockchain and, and crypto really is, is two, obviously two different things. Crypto, uh, uh, so Bitcoin is the, is the, is the token. I think about it in a very different way to these guys. I think. I'm not as technically in mind with these guys. These guys were stood here 20 minutes before we, we sat down, and I understood every other third word of what they were saying. Um, for me, um, <laughs> no, it was worth in some place. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, Bitcoin is the Bitcoin is the token, and, 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 and blockchain is the is the technology. So, um, like you, like like Danny said. Um, Bitcoin was, was, was brought about to um, solve a problem. It, became, it, was, it was kind of launched as the a, as a cash of the future or the, or, or the digital cash of the future. Um, I suppose the media see it mostly as, as an asset, but I think that's wrong. It's obviously uh, more akin to uh, providing uh, social payments, which I think is the, the, the problem we're trying to solve with, with crypto. Um, now, you, you all know that, 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 that there's volatility involved in, in cryptocurrencies, and some of them, like, uh, these guys call them shit coins and altcoins, um, and they're very much into Bitcoin, which I completely understand. Um, what we're looking at with building a stable coin is, is really um, providing a way of um, taking the advantages of all things on the blockchain, all things crypto, uh, and turning it into something that the everyday person can probably understand a bit better. Um, and we all know for many, many years, if you think it's hundreds of years, that we, that we have um, uh, fiat values. Um, so the, the purpose of stablecoin is to provide uh, a, 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 a payment, um, I suppose you might call it a software, but a payment system that allows you to take advantage of all the, all the good things about cryptocurrencies, but also uh, remain uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, um, in a value that you, that you are you know, familiar with. 
Um, stable coins are uh, picked to uh, a commodity. It can be gold, it can be, can be currency, it can be assets. Um, our stable coin is pegged to GBP. It's cool. called GBPT. All right, so our first question, which I thought would take 30 seconds, is five minutes in. I want to boldly go to the second question, which should also take five minutes, but I think we could be here for three hours. Why do you believe that this is important, the technology or the coin? <laughs> we'll keep it away from that. Um, I think uh, Bitcoin itself, and what, what Daniel touched on the start as well, with the separation of money from state, um, that is uh, a decentralized trust of man. That is the, the, the genius, the, the invention, the innovation. Um, and that is important from, um, you know, we live in this UK um, financial privileged world and, and the US and, and places around the world are financial privileged. There's a lot of world that don't live in their areas. Um, I think if anyone's paid attention to Bitcoin recently, we've seen El Salvador adopt an as legal tender. Um, they have 80-85% of their countries own banks with no digital financial infrastructure in place for those people. Uh, they now have Bitcoin as a bank and are able to, to use that in everyday payments and shops and everywhere they go. Um, so I think, for me, um, the financial inclusion is, is such, such a, um, a, a big invention and innovation. I think we're all excited about that. Flip side, Jamie, do you want to speak to challenges? These challenges that are coming our way around crypto. Um, well, crypto and Bitcoin are two very different things, so please separate the two. Um, crypto is just going to trend towards zero against Bitcoin. It's been doing it since 2014, since all of the old coins started forking against uh, the Bitcoin code base, and then Ethereum came around in 2013. It's that broken of creating Ethereum 2. Um, and then they have lots of copycats as well. So they're just going to continue to, to make noise. Whereas Bitcoin um, is where the real innovation is happening within uh, the cryptographic circles. Um, we've recently had uh, the biggest updates of the protocol, which enabled uh, Taproot, which enables like small signatures, which probably means nothing to most people. But the actual technology that this can enable. Um, can just open Bitcoin up to many more people. So the the biggest um, risk around Bitcoin is misinformation from salesmen that are trying to educate through sales materials. Um, and a lot of people do unfortunately get misin misinformed uh, and they believe that they're actually just absorbing information but they're just being sold to. So that's the biggest risk. And then there's some technical challenges that we've got to overcome, but it's not, this isn't the platform. I feel like getting very ready to speak. <laughs> so I don't agree. Um, but when I think of challenges to, I don't think about just, just Bitcoin, I think of challenges to um, the industry really as challenges to adoption. So it's, it's I think, okay, we're not, not all salesmen, right? But I, you know, I want you to use the GPPT stable, right? So, so what, what are the challenges to getting the adoption? What's the challenge of you guys out there with your businesses individually holding uh, crypto? Uh, whether that's Bitcoin, whether that's a stable coin, or whether that's a old coin, if you want to get into that sort of thing. And I, I see the challenges in three ways. So, education is the first one. And this is obviously a start. We sit in front of people and we tell you about about uh, cryptocurrencies and stable coins. That's the first. That's the first problem. So, um, what we'll hear probably is that crypto is trustless. Um, that, that you know it's on, it's on a blockchain. It's immutable. Um, transactions are faster and cheaper and better and all this sort of stuff. But what does it really mean? You know, to you. I mean, trustless is, is, is great, but if you don't understand why it's trustless, it doesn't mean anything to you. And the second challenge I think we're going to have um, is, well, well, as part of education, it's, it's a bit complicated, so um, I, 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 like I said before, I don't understand every third word that these guys say, because these guys are you know, super, super clever, right? So that's, that's a problem. It's, it's very complicated, so that's a challenge to adoption. Um, and it's also you know, seen as being risky at the moment. Again, that's part of education. But second, Second bit that I, I think that, that challenges adoption of, of, of cryptocurrency. In, I mean, I, I'm talking on a, on, a, on a global kind of big scale where institutions start getting involved in stable coins and the uh, like. Um, I think it's regulation. Uh, and these guys will be aiming for saying it, um, but I think that um, you know, regulation is a, is a key part in this for major players to get involved. Uh, and also liquidity. Um, so you know, there's lots and lots of exchanges out there, lots and lots of people wanting to buy and sell crypto, um, but liquidity can be a bit fragmented. So that's probably a challenge as well to adoption. 
just quickly touch on I guess regulation as well on that side and uh, yeah we, we've had um, our fair share of um, issues with regulation over the years in different jurisdictions all around the world um, and I think I agree in terms of the adoption of threats and not threats adoption I think the barrier holding back is uh, regulation in a way to larger institutes and the companies be involved in that doubt that is um, it's regulation for regulation's sake for the most part um, and unfortunately that's the way the world works in a lot of areas and that's the way we have to go. Um, but I would rather have regulation less for regulation's sake clearly, um, but regulation for protection of the consumer, um, which is something that you know even you see in the UK FCA recently um, pushing on a campaign to help protect the consumer and they made a, a jingle in the video to help protect the consumer. No consumer is going to watch it um, in reality. And that is they should be less clamping down on the company as a whole to have operations of branding in some respects. There's a, there's a level obviously that's needed for that. But they need to actually focus on things that actually protect the consumer themselves. And if that's vetting coins that are going on to these exchanges, so all coins and things like that, um, you know, you can go to Coinbase and Binance and the likes these days and you can buy a Bitcoin under the sun that you've never heard of before. Um, that is more dangerous than, um, you know, simply. Or well, that's the better regulation to almost uh, vet the coins going on to these exchanges. Um, I think. Um, and things like uh, proof of reserves to check that um, these Bitcoin exchanges out there are holding 100% of the reserves of customers for us. So I think the regulation, but well, in a smart regulation, would really not. And uh, the regulation always comes with a wrap uh, in mind, which is always the focus, unfortunately. Yeah, Mike, your project was recently regulated um, here on the island by the NSA. What was that process like? Yeah, we received a, a license approval in, in January. Um, the process was actually really good. We, we, we had a decision to make where, where we were going to launch the stablecoin, where we were going to base the stablecoin. And so 12 months ago, we decided that we would do it here. And well, a little, a little bit than 12 months ago. Um, Gibraltar were pulling us towards their jurisdiction, saying, you know, come over here with a DLT framework, we're really happy that the, the state bank will bank you. Uh, and I thought, I, 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 I've been on the island for like six years. Um, and the, the, the sort of the, the founding team was on the Isle of Man and, and that sort of thing. So we, we really wanted to be here. We, we went and spoke to the regulator uh, for the presentation of what we're looking to do. And that first meeting, we were expecting sort of, you know, sort of percentage terms. We were looking at sort of 10 to 20 percent success rate. And we, were, we were thinking Gibraltar is going to be sort of 90 percent success. So at that point in time, we were looking at moving, you know, moving this whole thing to Gibraltar. But on our first meeting with the FSA, the, the feedback was such a was so positive. Um, that we left the meeting thinking this is now looking quite likely. You know, we, we, we're quite confident now. Um, the team we put together um, that had a compliance, and you know, we, we we're both looking like we've got a very, very strong team of, of compliance individuals. And so after that first meeting, yeah, we, 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 we kind of got the idea that it was going to be you know, successful. So um, not that the next sort of eight months weren't particularly painful um, with the FSA. Um, I mean, they did a great job. They put us through the, the ringer, uh, asked all the right questions, interviewed all the right people. Um, somehow, we got it. Uh, license in January, um, yeah. But I mean, my, I, 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 spoke, I spoke to the FSA following our license approval, and I, I didn't, I didn't want to blow too much smoke at their bonds. But yeah, they were, they were really good. They were flexible. They were open to new, new ideas. Uh, they had a few wobbles in the process, but um, hats off to them. They, they you know, were, they normally, you know, you, 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 people have told us when we came, when we started doing this project, not in the month of Sundays you're going to get this thing right. You're not going to get it's going to be death by a thousand nodes. Uh, it didn't turn out to be the case. Um, I don't think it's open season on the Isle of Man for new projects uh, to become regulated. I think you've got to go with the right idea, the right, the right mentality. Um, but yeah, the process was pretty good. So, people may look to regulation um, and are all for consumer protection, but the, the biggest issue that I've found, and I've been speaking to ESMA, which is the European Securities Regulator, I was speaking to SISEC in 2012, trying to educate them on what Bitcoin was. Um, Danny's had a, a similar thing here. Um, and innovation always precedes regulation. So if you're actually doing anything very innovative, then the, the regulation just isn't going to exist. And um, I think leaning on regulators too much is a badge of honor. Um, you just have to look to 2008 and look at the banks. They was all regulated when they decided to blow up the entire financial system around the world. So yeah, great. Um, the, I don't think it's a perfect solution. I think there should be a balance between self-regulation and government regulation somewhat, um, or from, 
from a, a regulating entity that actually knows what they're regulating. So it, it's all about dialogue. Um, and so far, what I've found on the island is the FSA have been very open to, to dialogue. We haven't realized I'm a bit outspoken. Um, so I will always stand on my ground and I deal with the, the regulators in Australia as well very frequently. And we're pushing back on some of their regulation that they proposed just recently, um, which has massive privacy implications for every customer of every Bitcoin slash uh, shitcoin casino um, in Australia. And they've also decided to have a target to reduce uh, from 412 platforms down to 12. Um, so they're literally trying to force businesses out through regulation. And all that does is create more gardens and a competitive advantage for everybody that can be in the group uh, and everybody that's outside where the real innovation can happen and are just being shoved out. Um, so regulation isn't the, the, like the big all and end all. Uh, I think there's got to be a, a happy balance somewhere. I think a lot of people who come to Bitcoin come to Bitcoin because they um, value a little bit of a freedom from traditional institutions and, and governments. No, I think we just know history. We, we've seen money abused throughout history from glass beads, from shells, um, all the way through to coin clipping throughout the Roman Empire, the debasement of money. Um, when somebody has control and power over the money supply, they will abuse it. They will use it to, to, to further their own means. Um, the Cantonian effect is very real. Um, we're, we're witnessing that today and over the last couple of years uh, with asset prices. Just look at the housing market. Who's buying up houses around the world? Okay, we can continue that debate later at the bar. I love it. Um, in the meantime, we did talk, Danny did mention the, the need for self regulation as well. So I do think it's important that we talk about how we're protecting ourselves in this space and how consumers can protect themselves. So, Danny, in the context of Coin Quarter, can you maybe speak a little bit to how we should or could be holding your? your Bitcoin or, or other coins and, and how you can protect yourself in that process? <laughs> um, from a, I'm talking from a customer perspective and not how the exchange holds the coins. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess one of the things we obviously, even though as an exchange, we're custodying um, Bitcoin for a lot of clients, um, we don't want to do that. Um, you know, we may not from that, we're just doing it um, as part of the product and part of the offer. Um, what, uh, I guess is what we try and push as well is self custody. Um, self custody, I guess, though. The reality is, um, people, you know, famous quote, people are lazy. Uh, people like easy user experiences, um, and they'll come and they'll hold Bitcoin in an exchange like ourselves. Um, we would love them to hold it self custody, but they, they won't. Um, it takes a bit of time to learn that. It is a learning curve, don't get me wrong, it can be very difficult. Um, I guess from a wallet perspective, the, the safest way obviously is a, a hardware wallet called storage side. Um, I don't want to go into too much of the, the technical details of these, <laughs> trying to keep this very high level. Um, but that again is a little bit more technical, um, you've got a bit more tech savvy in some respects. The UX of these things are getting better and better as, as years go by. Um, so over time, hopefully, people will start out with the sort of the easy um, UX to actually make use of it. Their hardware wallet, store it themselves, keep it in their home themselves. Um, but again, that comes with lots of different trade-offs of, you know, when the house goes up on fire, you use the, the, the call storage device and you use your Um So yeah, this, this uh, is quite an, an in-depth um, conversation piece that I like So, as an example, what we do, we actually force users as part of our terms to actually take points off our platform. Um, personal credit to, to Mt. Gox, for anybody that has PTSD uh, from Mt. Gox, it's been in bankruptcy longer than it was actually a real thing, but they lost about 400 million at the time, which is probably worth about 6 billion right now. Um, so we actually force users to withdraw their coins and take custody of them. Uh, we don't want to hold people's coins, not your keys, not your coins. It's uh, a lesson that is normally learned in blood. I think when I, when I think about um, wallets, I think when, if, if, someone's going to, if someone comes to you and says, I'm going to give you a load of gold uh, or a big bundle of cash, the first thing you're going to think of right away, you're going to put it. I'm going to buy a safe. What sort of safe am I going to buy? How big is it going to be? What's it for? So the same thing is, is, is happens when you, when you think about cryptocurrency. 
Um, I'm, you can use it, you know, you can, there's, there's two different ways of, of, of storing crypto. You can use, uh, in general terms, um, a, you've got a hardware wallet uh, or a software wallet. Um, a hardware wallet is a, is a, is, is a, is a device, I've got in my pocket. Uh, it's a device that stores your private keys in, in hardware. And this sort of thing, you can keep your, you, you know, quite a lot of um, coins on safely, as long as you don't leave it in a, in a bin somewhere and end up for, scrounging around a tip for several years. That's something some individual did. Is it backed up? Probably not. It's, got, it's not a lot of money on it. Um, or there's a or software wallet where, where you, know, you, you can keep um, small amounts of, uh, of crypto and then you can, you can, you know, you can be pretty, pretty happy that it's not going anywhere because you know, you've got the private keys and the, 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 well, the store on mind is fine. So yeah, so think about your, think about your wallets, think about you know, what, what, what the purpose of holding the cryptocurrency is. I, I am. Um, I do want to spend some time talking about scams and, and hacks because one of the the great things about not your keys, not your coins is when you control your crypto or your whatever Bitcoin or whatever coin that, that we're talking about, um, it's much less vulnerable to being taken from you. So we're we're talking about. I mean, it could be physically taken from you, or it could be burned, or whatever. But it, it's less vulnerable to. to to hacking. Um, however, there are still a lot of scams in the industry, and I think there's a general concern with people that I talk to that um, a lot of the crypto that was purchased was originally purchased with ill-gotten gains, which is not a phrase I would use very often, but has been suggested to me. Um, so, so there seems to be concern of if this crypto comes to me, or if I'm an exchange and I accept this crypto, how do I know where it's coming from? Um, Danny, can you speak a little bit to how you guys manage AMLs? Yep, sure, yeah. <clears throat> um, so yeah, that's obviously a, a real um, consideration and worry for some people. Um, generally, uh, every the background, um, every exchange out there in the world generally now will pretty much run um, a form of tracking tool, which is, enables you to, um, because Bitcoin and the world coins are public ledgers, and you can see all the transactions throughout the history, uh, you're able to use tracking tools such as Chainalysis, so that's a kind of fuel is out there. Um, by doing that, you can track Bitcoin, for example, back to when it was very first mined, all the way through every transaction in its lifespan, all the way through to the end point. Um, so, as you mentioned there, we will see some that come from the criminal activity and they get flagged in, in, on the tools, and at which point it lands at an exchange, we would, um, I guess, um, have a, we would, well, there's, there's certain ways you can do it with ratings of things and percentages that come through. In terms of how much percentage of the transaction one Bitcoin has arrived, what percentage of that, if it's 0.1% has come from Dogo gains, as you mentioned, um, then you know it's, it's likely it's just been tainted by something um, insignificant and something um, that may probably not have anything to do with the actual uh, account holder that's sent the Bitcoin. Um, so there's a lot of things to weigh up there, a lot of um, animals to look at or um, to rate, should we call it. Um, from that, yes, obviously there's a consideration um, from an end user. If you've sent some Bitcoin in and you get flagged up, you can be flagged up for something like you're innocent for, and, and obviously um, exchanges will pay into you and the regulators might get into um, If you've done nothing wrong, then clearly no problem. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I think from the AML perspective, um, Bitcoin in itself is far more, and um, other currencies are far more transparent than the current banking world and structure we have there. Um, so it's a, it's a tool that is not uh, able and, uh, or not possible to be used within the traditional financial world. Um, so it's something that I think people overlook and don't even realise this has happened in the background all the time and that's why um, it's not fully on as Bitcoin as, as people used to think it was. Um, you can track all that work. It's very good. Cool. So, it's, uh, you would be absolutely crazy to use a put a system where every single transaction is traceable for criminal activity, um, but idiots exist and they do get caught um, because they use the, the wrong forms. They should be using HSBC. Um, <laughs> they'll even make the, the, the cash windows um, just big enough for the suitcases of cash to be passed through in Colombia. Real actually happened. There's a, a Netflix documentary on it as well. Dirty money. Um, but with regards to, to scams and uh, hacks and things, 
one thing that a lot of people don't consider when they're buying the next coin that's being pumped on social media is uh, when the developers and the, the underlying uh, people that created these old coins or shit coins decide, oh, we've made enough money, we'll not touch it anymore, and you're just left holding this very heavy bag that you paid however much of your savings for. You can't do anything with it, the network pretty much doesn't exist anymore. It might get supported um, by some exchanges that then have to take on the maintenance of that. So their platform then becomes exposed to having to maintain these uh, projects that are end of life and they should just be dead and buried, but you're left holding a, a bag of nothing. And this happens frequently. Canitizing, sorry. Uh, the canitizing of the regulatory point I made before about um, regulation and obviously focuses heavily on the AML perspective rather than the consumer protection of you know, which coins can be added to which exchanges. Um, I think that's uh, so something that's important. Yeah, I think you've got to be a special type of person to try nowadays to um, do anything dodgy with anything on the blockchain. Um, when we think about um, stablecoin, we think about GBPT, um, what, what we can do with a stablecoin is we, we, we're the issue of stablecoins, so we know where the stablecoin starts, we know the genesis of that, of that coin. And once we issue a stablecoin to one of our institutional clients, uh, stablecoin is used for payments, it's used for, um, well, just payments. Yes, it's just payments. Um, once it's used for, for payments, we, we can scan every single wallet that every single one of our stablecoin goes into. And we risk assess every single wallet, every single day, um, using a third party KYT, then you will be a transaction provider. Um, so, so we will know if any of uh, our coins go into a wallet um, that is tainted or it's been used for nefarious activity or is part of a jurisdiction that we shouldn't be operating in. And we can risk assess each one of those, it's like what daily tools. Um, same time as that, what we can do is um, following the right procedures and the right processes uh, as a regulated business, um, we can freeze the stable coin. So if it is being used for dodgy, uh, it, it's going to a dodgy place or it's going to a dodgy wallet, we can freeze away. Uh, not allow, not allow discretion has to be through uh, you know, the, the, the proper procedures. Um, I was going somewhere else with that, but I think Danny wants to. Yeah. I've got a so I think this is where old coins and stable coins miss the point about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is censorship resistant. Uh, resistant. So this is where Bitcoin derives its value from. So if you custody your own coins, nobody can just freeze them and take them from you arbitrarily. Um, it may be under controls, but those controls, uh, and we have seen them, we've seen it recently in Canada, um, where unless somebody gives over or hands over the Bitcoin, that's the only way that they can take it from you. Um, but if you, say, join the, the wrong political party that doesn't fit with those in power, or you attend, or you contribute to um, the wrong protest. Um, for example, the, the truckers um, in, in Canada, stable coins, they can just freeze your money. You can buy and use their stable coin for faster payments, same kind of thing. Um, but they can just freeze it. And that's the part that, and it's the uncomfortable truth that they either don't understand or they do and want that power. Um, but that's the difference between Bitcoin, it's yours, it's self-sovereign, um, and with, with Bitcoin, the best thing that I can say is if, you, if your value is stored in Bitcoin, you can up and move to a, a jurisdiction that will treat you better very easily, but if your money is subject to the control of other people, and this is why you shouldn't hold it on exchanges, uh, you should take custody of your own funds, and it's well worth the, the education and the self-education to learn this whole process, um, you basically end up with fuck you money, so you can just walk away uh, and move with your assets that can't be taken from you or arbitrarily frozen. So why don't we end that? <laughs> <laughs> was... Sure, yeah, I mean, like I say, we follow the, the, the right procedures when we, when we are to freeze uh, stable coin, and um, it has to be for very uh, unique circumstances. It's not arbitrary, and it's certainly not. Uh, but it is arbitrary. This Russian is holding this money. So if somebody comes to you and says, this Russian, this 
great great granddaughter of this person that is connected to Putin, like completely innocent, and they turn around and say, "You've got to freeze this boy." Are you doing it? Of course you are. It'd have to be on a case by case basis, right? <laughs> of course. Um, I've got nothing against uh, you know, anybody individually. Of course, it's not my decision to make either. Um, so I think this is this is the, the debate that could go for forever because it is a fundamental divide in I, I'm trying not to use the word crypto because I agree with you, it's not similar on this with Bitcoin, but it is the debate in the crypto community is why do people why are people excited about this? And some people are excited about it because it is self-sovereign and you do control it and that's wonderful. Uh, and those people are not buying the stable coin. And some people are excited about it because it's a it's a fast way to move money. There's a lot of other benefits, um, and and for that, maybe self-sovereign isn't, um, you know, isn't the be-all and all decision-making factor. But there's so many different reasons that, that people come to this, so I do want to, um, again, pick that up at the bar later, but for right now, I want to talk about if you were interested in, in getting Bitcoin or an alt currency or a stable coin, there are a few different ways that you could do it, but I want to specifically talk about exchanges. So what, um, in your opinion, and I'll ask both of you guys, um, what makes a good exchange? And what should people watch out for? <laughs> That's going to be an interesting question. Um, I, I think it depends on which a good exchange. There's a, a sliding scale, um, which we call it. I think an, an opinion um, that comes into play there as well. Um, so I think from one side from a regulatory perspective, yeah, of course, people want to see um, exchanges that are under some form of regulation that they trust and believe. So, whether it's under like Ireland, UK, US, and so on, um, and not in some location, uh, the Bahamas and the Seychelles and things that we've, we've seen um, finance. I think it was jump from the first finance, but I mean, they've jumped from uh, location to location for the last four or five years now. Um, I still don't think they understand what, where their headquarters is themselves. Um, so, there's a regulatory angle, um, so I guess the reputation. Uh, I think the other side, obviously, it depends on what we're calling an exchange as well. So I think traditionally, uh, in ourselves at Coin Corner, we were seen as like a Bitcoin exchange, cryptocurrency exchange. Um, what we're moving um, more towards now is coming away from using the terminology exchange, because we're, the exchanges out there for us are the Binance and Coinbase that have all these altcoins on there that you know, we're not trying to compete with. What's the point of these altcoins and these NFTs and things like that now that have been traded on there, they're traded for speculation and speculative purposes. Um, there's no real world use case for any of them. Um, so what we're trying to do at Coin Corner is focus more on what's real world use cases and actually bring Bitcoin into the real world and actually make everyday use cases for Bitcoin, uh, whether that's cross border payments, whether that's payments in person, whether that's e-commerce payments. Um, that's more the direction we're going um, from an exchange perspective. So I personally would obviously argue the opinion um, you know, you would find somebody that has, um, I guess, the consumer um, and, the, and the, the use case and the real world use case rather than uh, gambling on all costs. The What makes a bad exchange, I would say, is an exchange that will try and get you to sign up under the auspices of we sell Bitcoin. You can get into Bitcoin here, and as soon as you sign it, you buy this shitcoin, buy this shitcoin, this one's going up. Buy this shitcoin, buy this NFT, buy this shitcoin, and it's oh, you can learn about this shitcoin and get paid in this shitcoin. Um, that to me is just, it's it. I, I said it's the FSA yesterday, it should be regulated by the GSC platforms like that. The gambling houses, the, the casinos, um, and for me, the, the big red flag, apart from coins, more is old coins. I'm the only one that's allowed to give him a stick for that. Part. <laughs> but, um, so, and basically, platforms like ours, we we could make so much money by selling people garbage that is going to be worth nothing in six, 12, 18 months' time. But we'll make the, the trade fees. And any platform that is just purely there to derive value and to earn money. Um, then for me, a bit kind of short-term thinking, uh, whereas the the longer-term uh, 
value in this industry for me uh, specifically is building that bridge between the old and the new and giving people access to Bitcoin and all that it can offer. Um, but yeah, the, the bad players and the bad actors are definitely those that will um, play to greed uh, and try and trigger gambling uh, or speculative parts of the brain. Let's talk about um, stable coins. Since we're talking about um, shit coins or altcoins, there are some stable coins that are not um, well regulated, are not well backed, um, are not backed by the assets that they claim to be backed by. So stable coins can be a bit of a, um, a tough road to hoe, just like any other um, altcoin. So I'm hoping that we can talk about what makes a good stable coin. Um, what makes an exciting one, and what makes you excited about um, stable coins as a part of the future of finance? Okay, no, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so the most popular stable coin um, is USDT, so Tether. And I think the last count was you know, between USDT and USDT, there's 150 billion in stable coin in circulation. And there are questions over whether Tether is, is fully backed, and one would suggest perhaps it isn't. Um, Do you want me to bring power? <laughs> Do you want me to get power on the phone? <laughs> um, however, all I can speak of is, is, our, is our own stable point, how we deal with our own um, clash. Um, so, GBPT is backed 100% by GBP. Uh, we, put it in a, we put the GBP in a bank account. Um, we don't do anything with it. We don't invest it. We don't play around with it. We don't buy um, papers in Chinese property companies. And we don't buy Bitcoin. Um, so that's the safe, safe way we do it. Um, and that's about as far as I can go really with you know, the clash all that we keep because it's so simple and boring. Uh, it's just super safe. Um, I think, um, and, I, I, and I'm, I'm not very really here, I suppose, to talk about Bitcoin. Um, I'm here to talk about cryptocurrency and, and the future of payments, I suppose, the way we see it. Um, and we see, we see stablecoin as being, you know, sort of getting a huge traction in the market. Um, you know, compared to this time last year, we've got sort of, you know, from 5 billion to 170 billion of stablecoin out of USD, in USDT stablecoin. So, um, yeah, we see it as, as the future of payments. We don't think that, we don't think stablecoin is the future of banking. We think, we think cryptocurrency and, and Blockchain technology is the future of banking and payments and lending um, and decentralized finance have been an important, you know, important part. Um, there are cryptocurrencies that you can't you know, use on centralized finance, um, most of them probably can, um, but um, that's the way we see it. We see it as being super safe, uh, we see it as being regulated, and we see it as being a place where you would go to um, to store your uh, funds uh, in a, in a, in a, you know, a, a pegged and stable store of money. Yeah, I want, I want everyone's actual opinion on, on the future of finance because I, I'm reminded often of a quote that I think is um, debated whether Head Report said this, but you know, the, the, the legend is he said, if I asked people what they wanted, um, they would have told me they wanted faster horses. Um, so the car kind of became left field. Um, so where do we think that banking or finance or currency um, is going? Is this left field? Who's driving? Um, so, what is purported to be decentralized finance is actually very centralized. Um, when it gets hacked, they turn it off very quickly, um, and then they have to do the investigations. So, the, the whole decentralized aspect is generally a marketing term in today's uh, current incumbent, uh, current form uh, of what is classed as DeFi. The thing for me um, with stable coins is for basically the problem that they solve in the Bitcoin and crypto industry is to being able to, to move liquidity when traditional uh, and the legacy mechanisms are really slow. Uh, I don't know how many people have tried to send 50, 60 million uh, from the, the US to Japan overnight uh, or at a weekend or when the banks are closed. Um, you've got three or four different correspondent banks um, that it's got to pass through, uh, it can take to five days, when the Bitcoin markets never close, or the crypto markets never close. So it's just to, to, solve, the, to solve the problem of moving the fiat liquidity around. So there's a reason why 
vast majority of the volume is in USD because the US dollar is pretty much widely accepted as the, the world reserve currency for the moment. Um, so I am the, the way that I look at a DVP stable coin, not to attack your product, is you're competing against faster payments because there's there's not much demand for international settlement in GDP. Most of it is done in, in the US dollar, I may be wrong. Um, there may be some huge demand that I don't see in the markets, but most GBP crypto exchanges have very, very little volume. Um, so for me, it's almost like the USD kind of solves the problem, whilst uh, USD is in demand around the world. But ultimately, you're just moving the trust from, the, from one party to another. Um, and also the innovation is the, the speed of the, the transfer and there's no actual real need for uh, an underlying blockchain or trustless um, mechanism to, to transfer that volume. You can pretty easily do it like in a federated fashion using a MySQL database between say 10, 20 different actual trusted people that can do uh, and manage the settlement on the legacy system. Uh, so, I don't really see any innovation for the actual point. <laughs> no, just very quickly. So um, we, we know that um, the uh, trading volumes of uh, uh, USC stable coins is around about 30, 30 billion, sorry, yeah, about 90, 90 billion a day. Um, the trading volume of Bitcoin is about 30 billion daily. So we know that there's, 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 there's a need and there's, there's, there's a market requirement for stable coins to be used. Um, So just come on to my, yeah, that is, yes, that is USD stable coins. That is the figure of trading volume for USD stable coins. There is no current um, regulated GBP stable coin that you can trust on the market. So we know that globally, 30 uh, odd percent of transactions are, are conducted in USD. That's 30 odd percent are conducted in, Euro, in, in euros. And about 10, 12 percent are conducted in GBP. So if we, Work backwards from that. We're expecting to have a you know, demand the market within the market gap. I'm willing to bet you don't know. Um, Can I show you your statement? Don't want to go back. Especially when I'm signing isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I think to the future, there's a couple of a couple of points that um, I know touching on there with the stable coins and what trading and volume for stable coins and all that, a lot of that is traded for Bitcoin itself or for uh, altcoins and so um, great, that's trading. I, all of that use case, I want to see real world use cases, not speculative gamble. Um, so going forward in the future finance side, if I, for example, um, I was a bank and I had Barclays and uh, HSBC and I'm going to make a transfer for you to from yourself to yourself um, on Saturday night, for example, I'm holding GDP, but you want US dollar on the side. I can automatically, so for example, with Coin Corner, what we can do is automatically press a button on the website. You can flip your GDP into Bitcoin, send it straight over to HSBC on the side, and they can automatically flip it to US dollar. Um, so, again, Bitcoin is a mechanism to actually move the money, the, the money rails, the payment rails across the world. Um, and that can be done anywhere in the world, and that can be done over the Lightning Network, which I'm not going to get into, but that's related to Bitcoin, and um, that's kind of the payment rails for Bitcoin uh, these days. Um, and that's instant transaction, instantly sold, and um, fractions of the penny for the cost of the transaction. Um, so you're able to start moving the money in different ways around the world. So I think the future of finance for me is a lot of lightning rails, um, which is on top of Bitcoin. Um, the stablecoin side comes into play, there's still centralized points there, so there's still Barclays and HSBC, still central points. Uh, central points of failure. Um, so where you're, and again, this is going back to the financial privilege of the, the Western world we live in, um, and when you look at the, the rest of the world out there and the globe, you'll be seeing um, people that will find a use case for a stable coin like El Salvador, going back to the example from earlier on, where they don't want to hold Bitcoin to follow the island so, so they are receiving via the Lightning Network in, on, on the Bitcoin network, and that is also for the dollar as soon as they receive it in their wallet to the tether. So US dollars have no touch on that. Um, so they're still holding the hidden value against the tether. 
And when they send it out again, it goes back over the uh, Bitcoin rails again. Um, so you can start to see that there is a use case in these countries that don't have central banks and don't have stable currencies and have hyperinflation like the Venezuelans and the Argentines. Um, and there is use cases for that. Um, so I think going forward to the future of finance, as we touched on there, there's, there's a variety of um, areas that need to be uh, gaps or problems that need to be solved along the way. Um, and it's not just in our, our Western world as well, it's on a global scale. So there's, there's going to be lots of um, use cases and lots of solutions to things. There's no one silver bullet. Um, but I think the majority of everything here is, for me, built on Bitcoin, built on Lightning, and built on the way to the Yeah, we, we, I, I run a business, and we, we actually pay about half our staff in, in Bitcoin or, or another currency. We pay a lot of our providers, a lot of our vendors. Um, you know, there is a very real use case, so it is an exciting time. We're coming up, actually, to the end of the time where we just get to talk, but before we stop, I'm wondering if I could do like a quick poll in the room, because um, I want to know how many of you we've like just completely lost, how many of you are excited, all that. So I know these guys brought some people with them, so I'm excluding you, so no hands up from you guys. But for those of you who are not attached to someone on this stage, could you throw your hand up if you have purchased cryptocurrency of any kind before today? That's awesome. Okay, so of those people, did we make you more excited about it? No. <laughs> did we, okay, are you the same? Did you? Who bought shit coins? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. Of, the, of those people, how many bought a non-Bitcoin coin? <laughs> we apologize. Um, okay, so we didn't get anyone more excited, but how many of you are less excited or more pessimistic about the future of where this is going? Okay, so that's good. <laughs> See, I got a little worried there for a minute. Um, okay, so before we turn it over to questions, I want in two minutes or less, um, is Bitcoin the future? of cryptocurrency. You go. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, very quickly, yeah, I think, uh, as I've already touched on there, um, technology is building layers and um, you need a, a strong foundation layer and Bitcoin is, is the de facto one, it's got that foundation layer, it's a slow uh, protocol in terms of development being on it and that's needed for what it's then built on top of. Um, so I think right now Bitcoin has a 13 year experience as, as, as a, uh, technology goes on, the linear effect team gets uh, more successful as time goes by. Um, and I think what we have is that great strong foundation and going forward, the layer twos and layer threes will be the other bit pieces on top that people want to play around, which is, is fine and great. But uh, yeah, Bitcoin will be the de facto. Um, just one more show of hands. We've actually learned something by actually digging here. That would be. Yay! It's worth a while. So, Bitcoin is pretty much our only chance of separating money and state. If Bitcoin dies tomorrow, all of the other will follow. And there is no chance any government around the world will let a network bootstrap to the point of where Bitcoin did, to be where it came, became decentralized enough, so it's actually really decentralized, uh, where it can't be stopped. Uh, they will never ever let that happen again. The cat is well and truly out of the bag. So if Bitcoin succeeds, it can be amazing um, for, for the world um, for lots of different reasons. It's not perfect and it has uh, a lot of obstacles and hurdles to, to overcome. A lot of uh, challenges um, and a lot of attacks. Um, we've seen one recently where some shitcoiner paid five million to Greenpeace to try and say that Bitcoin's bad for the environment. Um, but it's actually based not in reality, it's just them trying to sell something, uh, and that was Ripple. So if you actually bought Ripple, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> really sorry, uh, you got fooled. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, for me it's, it's our only opportunity of separating money and state, uh, and somewhat going away to, to fixing some of the ills, not all of the human problems uh, that exist, but a lot of the ones, and the, the skewed incentives uh, that come about when people can control and manipulate the, the supply of money. Um, 
Um, so going back to the question is, um, is, is Bitcoin the future of finance? No, um, it's not the only solution uh, of finance. I think, I think, think about the technology, I think, think about, the, about, about blockchain technology. I think, I think everybody has their own solution or problem they're trying to fix, right? So if cryptocurrency, whether it's a stable coin, whether it's Bitcoin, fixes that problem for you, then go ahead and use it, right? If you want to have a store of value that you can, you can relate to, it's GDP, it's immediate USD. Um, store then, then, then go ahead right, and, 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 use, and use a stable coin. If you want to use a, a, a Bitcoin and, and, and uh, you know, invest in Bitcoin, then, then go ahead. It's, it's, good, it's got use cases in payments. Stable coins have got use cases in payments. They're all the future of finance, but not the shit coins. All right, we have a very open future finance. Danny, you get the last word. Do not get people by backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I first pronounced the stable coin, but instead of going five, uh, nice comment, they, they can be built on Bitcoin, I guess is, is for me the key point. You can have a stable coin on Lightning, um, and that will still be on Bitcoin, you know, the infrastructure that is. Awesome. Thank you so much to all of you. I think we're going to turn it over to Luke, who's going to manage questions. But uh, thanks for listening to us for a half hour. So I'm going to open up to questions now, so if you want to raise your hand, I'll pop on over and you can ask your questions to the panel.